Good morning, uh, folks, and thank you for joining us. Sorry, I, I left it till a couple of minutes after 11 um, as we were later opening the room uh, than we normally are. So there's still a lot of people coming in. Um, thank you for, for joining us for, for today's webinar, which is um, all about event management plans in pictures um, with, with Alan Wilson, who is a, he's a crowd safety consultant based in Australia. Um, I know a lot of you... Uh, I say no, Alan, at least know of Alan from, from the online world and Twitter and LinkedIn and, and the work he does. Alan's a bit like me in that he's very, very visual in, in how he kind of comprehends things and and uh, communicates things. So uh, the next uh, hour or two um, is going to be is going to be quite visual. So I hope that's the kind of thing you enjoy. Um, I think one of the one of the key things. Uh, we all need to remember, I guess, what event management plans is. The point of an event management plan is to communicate key information, um, and not everyone is going to read your, you know, eighty-page, one hundred and twenty-page, three hundred-page document from cover to cover. And um, that's just unlikely in the world we live in. And an awful lot of people um, take in information better in a in a visual format. Um, so I know even a few years ago, ourselves and Safe Events, we started doing some of our event management plans in videos, um, which we found quite useful with some statutory agencies and stakeholders who you would definitely take more key information away from a, say, a six or seven minute video um, than they would from, you know, sifting through the event management plan, trying to find the bits they were interested in, um, et cetera. And when I say a video, um, you know, it's something it's created in PowerPoint and you export it as a video. You don't need you don't need camera equipment, anything like that. Um that the one I'm thinking of particularly was for a parade event. So again, you're you're mapping the route, you're doing your risk maps, um, you're showing where vehicles gather, where pedestrians gather, all those kind of things very visually on maps, and then you're just building a slideshow out of it that you then export as a video. So I mean that's our kind of version of this. We've not ventured as far with with visual event management plans as as uh, alan has um, and you'll get some glimpses of, of what he does and um, we've gone a little bit down that road and there's no doubt there's value in it um again the feedback we get from when we do those types of videos and stuff is 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 really good they take a bit of time but if you build them in as part of your process for planning an event um a lot of the materials you're creating already can just be repurposed and used for for the video um, so you've probably gathered from the, the the posts and stuff on social media, this session is going to be a little bit different. Um, Alan has put significant time and effort into building a kind of a, a webinar experience, a presentation experience that involves an awful lot of tech on his end. Um, a lot of stuff you wouldn't even think would be required, but the way Alan likes to deliver and the, the quality he likes to deliver and the quality of files and stuff means he has put a serious amount of work into this. So I'm really looking forward to it. I spent a few hours on it with Alan yesterday, um, you know, looking through it, getting sneak peeks at certain areas. There are elements of today's um, webinar that I've not seen yet that I know are coming. Um, so what I would say is do wait till the end. Um, and if you can't wait till the very end, definitely catch it on the video. Um, Alan's going to introduce us to something that the world has not seen yet, which may interest some of us greatly. Um, I've not even seen it. He wouldn't show it to me. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing it later. Um, as usual, put questions in the chat. Even the Q&A section of this is a bit different, but do put questions in the chat. And if we get an opportunity to kind of go through them in the Q&A at the end, we will. Um, we will be leaving Alan in his flow once he gets started to, to deliver this, unless there's something catastrophic goes wrong or the signal goes down on our end and I need to let Alan know. So other than that, he will be going start to finish through with a break. There will be a break along the way so everyone can grab a coffee or whatever uh, and come back then for the more structured kind of a QA and a session. Um, so I think the last thing I need to do is thank the guys in, in Activo events. I'm not sure any of them are in the room today. I know they're on site. Lucky for them. Um, so I know Paul and his team are on site, but as usual, um, I think this is our 19th webinar in this run. So I must have thanked Paul and Acto Events 19 times, I guess, um, at this stage. But again, um, their their support, uh, their unending support in everything we try and do for the industry is is appreciated. 
um, and we're, we're glad to have them involved. Uh, I think that's about the size of it. Let me have a quick look at my notes. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I would say sit back and enjoy this one. I have a feeling it's one of the ones where the chat may be a bit quieter than normal. There's a lot there's a lot on screen. There's a lot to take in. Not a lot of text. You're not reading things, but there's a lot in this. So I would say sit back um, and enjoy it. And I think all that's left really is for, for me to hand over to Alan. And it's it's evening time in his corner of the world. So I think he's just been fed and he's ready to go with this. So uh, Alan, whenever you're ready, if you want to take over the screen and do your thing, I will turn my mic and camera off um, okay. and you are good to to take over and for the rest of you i will talk to you i will talk to you at the end um for the q a end of things and to wrap up right so my mic's live just we'll put an edit point in here for you uh so you can hear me mark just checking yeah yeah we can hear you you're good all right so that's okay because this technically isn't the beginning It's night time over here. I normally start work, so you'll see me all dressed up in black because that's what event people wear. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Event Management Plans in Pictures. Before you, you see the pictures. That is the journey we're going on. It's going to be a huge experience. Your eyes will be scattering all over that screen. There's very few words. In fact, this slide in the middle has the most number of words on any slide at all. I've had a lot of fun putting this together. Uh, the chat facility, as Mark said, probably will be quiet today. Uh, you might want to avoid it a bit. It could be distracting. This is a visual medium. So a couple of little tips. First, go full screen. If you're on a PC, press F11. I've got things reversed on my, my keyboard, so I go function F11. And if you're on a Macintosh, command, shift, and F. These three, th the three fingers, first three fingers will do it. The format is very simple. We're going to look at event management plans in pictures, especially with a crowd management focus, because you will see this is what I do. It'll go for 45 minutes to uh, an hour, depending. Uh, and you will walk away at that point with thought provoking ideas and tools. From that point on, if you hang around for the questionnaire, whatever, uh, I will be delving deeper. There will be a little surprise because I made my money and a lot of my um, income and I got my experience in the theater world as well. So we're going to have an intermission and there's a bit of a surprise in there for you as well. The world premiere of the COVID-19 queuing system that I've been working on will be at the end of the Q&A. So the first thing I'd like to do is this. Hi. G'day, I'm here. I'm just going to close something here. I want to start off by introducing the concept of the Chatham House rules. Now, some of you may or may not have come across this. I know we've got some ex-police officers, current police officers who are on here. And quite often we attend sessions and they start with the Chatham House rules. It's very simple. It's the rules for debating. It comes from Chatham House in London. There is only one rule. <laughs> Singular is plural, plural is singular, and I will read it for you because I am going to invoke it for this session. When a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants, namely you, are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speaker, in this case me, nor that of any other one on the chat facility may be revealed. In other words, we can talk about the issues, we can talk about the things that are presented, but don't go around saying, or oh, Alan Wilson said, or Ben Crabb said, or Ian Mixter came up with this idea. Let's just collectively agree that sometimes we may let some things slip and you've got to not mention it. I attend their Crowded Places forums over here, which are vetted, and uh, they start every meeting with that. And we're always reminded of it. I have been to Saudi Arabia, Anybody speak Arabic? I know some of my Arabic friends are on here. I've got it there as well. Question times. I've mentioned there's going to be a 10 minute break with a twist. If you're back in six and a half minutes, you uh, will get a bit of a surprise, especially if you're into toilets. 
music festivals and queues. Who thought they would be so fascinating? Uh, also, I mentioned the uh, the world premiere at the end. It's called the Chevron queuing system for maximum maximizing area capacities whilst maintaining physical distancing. This webinar is programmed like a rock concert. I'm going to go out hard. I'm going out fast. I'm going to pull it back. I'm going to build it up. I'm going for a big finish. Then I'm going to hit you with a full-on encore. And I talk at two speeds, fast and very fast. You probably expected me to talk about my background. I'm not going to yet. I'm going to take you inside my control room at uh, Emirates Arena, Glasgow 2014. 10 past six on the clock. Who gets up at that time in the morning? I want you to focus on the files down there, the blue files, because that's part of the reason I do what I do now. Uh, we were told we were babysitting for part of that job, which was really frustrating, especially when you've got a wonderful team like this who are there to look after people and keep people safe. If you pop out the window, you look out the window in the top right hand corner, you can see Celtic Park. This was the uh, little computer I had and uh, I hope Peter Wharton's on here because he did say he was going to touch base. I remember being in Games HQ with Peter and uh, we were outside the office and we were talking about the files, the three files, the strategic, the operational and the front line. And he basically said, look, when the tough gets, you know, things get tough, the tough gets got, you have to rely on the instincts and your professional expertise. And hardly anybody ever looked in those files once the game started which was fascinating for me because I had 31 events in 10 days in two venues and no one actually referred to the files. So I went, this is really silly. So on this little baby here, and there's uh, Bob from my internet provider. And they're going to look after me today. I started some work and I know that some people have still have copies of this. So I, what I basically did was looked at the three frameworks and the three files and broke it down. Now, James Mildenhall, who I believe will have joined us because uh, he said he was going to, and Peter Wharton will, will remember this. I know James still has a copy. And basically I took what was in the files, which was what was on the, um, back then it was um, a two terabyte um, hard drive and a shared drive and basically gave, everybody access to the folders for their venues. So if you look at the toolbar along the bottom, those are the numbers of the sections. And if you click on it, it takes you to a page. So this is the supervisor one. It takes you to sections one to seven. If you click on it, it either opens a document, it opens a slideshow, or it takes you to the folder where you can get your document. Okay, this is really silly that we can't just access things. We have to rely on a paper document that's already out of date. There's the operations one. If you're uh, not familiar with uh, management theories, basically supervisor is day to day, week to week, operations is week to week, month to month, and frame the strategic stuff is, is yearly, five yearly and things like that. So I'm just skimming you through a few. Dot plans will come up later, um, big part of my life, and people waste a lot of time. Now just gone on to the second page for this one because I want to look at number 10, the spectator safety manager policies and procedures. If you click on the icon, it will take you to this. And if you hover the cursor, your cursor, over the top of any one of these, a little bubble pops up and it tells you what the procedure is. I'm going to just click on 31. It's going to take me to 31. And there we have what David, the security manager, put together without having to read everything at the key points I need to know. Something else really stuck with me. Some of you will know this location. Uh, the buses for the uh, security would turn up where the circle in the bottom left hand corner is. I drew this diagram nine times. Is that the best use of my time? I don't know. It was frustrating because at 4.30 in the morning, the buses with security didn't even stop there because the barriers weren't in place. And they, uh, when you actually got to the venue, they were supposed to follow the blue line, but the two-part pass tent and the VAHA wasn't even open and neither was the workforce check-in. We spent hours preparing things that weren't used. And Clyde agrees with me because he used to greet me as I went past, you can see Celtic Park in the background and Emirates Arena is in the distance. 
I like to tell stories and I like to elaborate with pictures. As you can see, there's not a word on the screen. I know how I do things. And a couple of weeks ago, I was chatting with James Milden Hall. Uh, we occasionally touch base. And he said, he was chatting about this webinar. And he said, do you, do you remember those 3D animated venue files that we used in Glasgow 2014? And I laughed and I said, James, you must know what's about to come up. So James and the crowd management team from Expo 2020, if you, if you are here, thank you. This is one of those animated files, and one from my venue, Emirates, Emirates Arena in Delmarnock, right next to the Games Village. Rupert Bassadoni's probably having kittens with this right now because it's CAD drawn and you can go down level to level. We found them by accident. It would have been nice to use them because the maps we were using, I thought the control room was in the basement and it wasn't. It's actually in the roof. And when we come around the next time, you'll see, I'll just point it out to you. When the roof goes back on, there it is, under that black line in the middle, that's where the control room was. I thought it was in the basement. Uh, the Sir Chris Hoy uh, velodrome on the right, the Basque, uh, badminton on the left. Uh, Chris, Sir Chris Hoy, what an amazing, and he's a lovely guy. So from there, right, got a couple of passports. Let's flick off and go to Australia. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, go through the latest iteration of a crowd management plan, which is part of event management plans, the way I do it. Uh, when I went through them last night, these I did step Mark right through this one. He said, do you do this for every event you work on? And I said, yeah, even if I'm not the crowd manager, I need to see in my head what, what is going on. So that's Samantha Jade. Uh, she's a Perth-born uh, singer and um, the university, Murdoch University, as part of their community engagement, put on free concerts. The purpose is to attract the students from around this area, and I'm in this catchment area, and then when they want to go to university, they'll pick Murdoch as the first one. At the outset, two things. First, I have permission to discuss this material in public. I have tweeted pictures over the years and some of the previous iterations of this plan are on my YouTube channel. The second thing is, uh, no, if at uh, no times, uh, just the chart, charter house rules, Chatham house rules. If uh, I put something up, if I worked on the crowd management plan, I will say so. Otherwise, this crowd manager analyzes things. So I just don't want there to be any misunderstanding. We do have some students on board and with some 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 event management lecturers. Um, I will, this is actually the tip of the theory for crowd management. I'll step you through it, it's going to be fast. If you have static pictures and you're using Keynote and PowerPoint, and I'm not gonna tell you which ones I'm using because I'm also using videos. What I want you to think about is, could you make that live? So my crowd management plans have two sections, key event areas, and crowd management plans. Now, if you're trying to screenshot everything I do today, you will run out of space. The current total is 1.44 gigabytes. So, the event areas, I can run it on a tablet, I can run it on an iPod, an iPhone, I can run it on a MacBook. I can also run it on a PC. Everything is hyperlinked, I press the button, it takes me to what I need. Similarly with the crowd management plan, the core business of what I do, the arrival profile, ice. I don't refer to the last um, mile, I call it the first leg and the last leg. Communication plans, uh, Peter Dalton covered that the other day, C4I, this was a C2 one, although I throw the I in uh, on all my events. Dim ice run times, and if I click on the emergency egress, it takes me what I need to know in an instant. I hope you're ready for this because this is fast. You're going to get an event management plan in approximately four and a half, five, five minutes. Hope you've got this on the big screen. I need to know the local council area. That's Murdoch University. And the red line is what overseas you call the last mile. I'm going to call it the last leg and the first leg. So it's the first leg. It's the first leg of getting to the event. It is 1500 meters. Seriously, it's just so funny how that worked out. And people arrive like this. 
they need to park their cars because public transport they won't use even though there's a train station not far from there over 2,000 car bays and we've got an event for three and a half thousand people and here they come color coded the majority are going to come from the left another council is below so they're not invited less from the top right and those that uh, live near me uh, will come in via the green line so what well the event boundary holds 5,000 it's 10 and a half hectares seriously 5,000 easy as you'll see references to what three words pop up I'm not going to talk about them um, you'll I'll ingrain it into your head um, you need to know the zones okay I could just draw them on a map but hey I could take them on click them off do whatever I need to know the main entrance and exits that's where they come they will predominantly come through C for this event I know because we've analyzed it I've done this event for four or five years so I know the place inside out the majority of the public coming there notice what I did there bang focus your attention okay 75 percent of the crowd come in through the front actually it's more than that 75 percent come from the right 20 come from the left and five percent come from the back emergency exits we need them the calculations are done for the first three so the red areas see the capacity I've got absolutely blow them away because the city of Melville and the town of Victoria Park ask specifically for my emergency evacuation calculations because it's two pages with two pictures and some maths and a decision whether or not we can stress test this facility. You'll see this in a second. Key locations, like most events, we have car parks. Accrod parking overseas, so I think you call it blue card, um, but people with disabilities. Stage, green room, sound vision switching you'll see a picture of the stage in a minute and you'll see why we need vision switches toilets a bar cart for VIP staff play area for the kids and food trucks I could just put that in the map people will look at it they'll walk away I will share with you this comes also as a PDF booklet as a booklet a5 booklet 12 pages in your pocket it could come as a PDF with hyperlinks to all the pictures and what you're seeing is the full animated version I also have a version that becomes the briefings for the staff. Ambulances are obviously important. Ironic that or coincident that the, <laughs> the what three word address is device beats fast for, for my ambulance. The other ambulance is a working university. So we need to be able to accommodate the normal uh, uh, drop, of, drop off and pick up route for the ambulance for the university. My ambulance and first aid is actually there at the near the uh, con concrete building there and the control room is actually there. Uh, this event has now now ceased to be because of COVID and a few other things. So I don't have a problem telling you where we, we sit. Vehicle access, dead simple. The food trucks turn up there, put on the hazard lights there. They go down there, down this road that is super reinforced because that's where the red fire truck goes. It's the only event I've ever done where we may have to put a show stop in place to get a fire truck in through gate three to go to the library, which is between gates four and five. Just one of the many things. We're events people, we're flexible. Hope I'm not going too fast for you, but this is exciting. <coughs> security, drop them in. Three, three and a half thousand people. The license I can tell you will be six security guards. I'm Delta One, the other five assist. In Keynote and PowerPoint and a few other things, when you do deployment plans, actually show them where they are going to go. In this case, 15 minutes after the end of the um, main act starting, they're going to move. You also need to look at your audience arrival profiles. If you've got history, then you could use it like this. 2016, we had scanners. It was a free event, but it was ticketed. 2017, we had scanners. 2018, we had clickers. 2019, I can actually put the real data in, but that was the predicted. Cumulative, uh, that's on the, on the hour as well. So every 15 minutes. Cumulatively, there we go. So the prediction is the dotted line. And if the curves go under the curve, the predicted, the numbers are going to drop. If it's above, they're either turning up early or we're going to get bombed. Again, you've got to track it. Crowd flow. 
And this is the one Mark knows I had kittens about last night. But <laughs> I had to rebuild all the next three slides. But I do it because I love it. So ice. People come to an event, they do something, they go. Some turn up late, we can manage that. Some leave early, we can manage that. Some hang around at the end while we're bumping out, we can manage that. So acrods are there, they go in, and then everybody else goes in like that. Color coded because the reds are the ones I will be watching for the greens, the guys out the front can watch. Circulation. Uh, it's been like this forever over here. You are not allowed to smoke at an event anywhere, indoors or outdoors, if you're selling alcohol, unless there's a smoking area, designated smoking area. So we push them outside the fence. The other side is this, is that uh, during the event, they're going to go to the food trucks, they're going to go to the toilets. There is a pinch point there. I've never had problems with it. Notice all the bush, by the way, the trees, we call it the bush. If there was a fire in this area, we have a bush um, fire management plan as well. The egress, well, we crack open E1 as an extra gate. And trust me, six to eight minutes and we're gone. We're good to go. The last leg is the reverse of the first leg, but it's the last leg on the way home. And it's still part of the experience and off they go. You need to know which roads they're going to come on. In the control room, we only had C2. I have the computers going, so I have the intelligence as well. You need to have the structure, who's doing what, who's talking to whom. And then what we have is actually who's responsible. So I'm smack bang in the middle there. OK, I cannot go and talk to Samantha Jade, even though she's a sweetie and uh, is absolute delight to work with. During showtime, that's not how it works. I talk to Glenn. I talk to security. And then I go to Andrew occasionally, and it's mainly Tony, but it's mainly Glenn. Dim ice model, if you're not familiar with it, you can read up on it. You can go to Professor Still's website, read up about it. I'm not going to get to read it. If you're on a phone, it's going to be too much information. It's a practical document, but it also has to have the emergency component. Speaking of emergencies, OK, we came up the other day, and I think it was Peter Dalton's webinar about using color codes it is amazing how many people don't know them there is an international standard for them personally i prefer plain english and i prefer people have earpieces so we don't have to um, be all secretive secretive but uh, i've worked one venue with a concert where code blue came over the radio we were in concert mode and a code blue is someone is drowning in the swimming pool go figure so what else have we got OK, the assembly areas, we all know about them, but hey, let's make a neat and breathe this stuff. These are the designated assembly areas for this university. Notice one of them is inside my event. Now, that's my safety in place. So I don't want people to go outside because they'll all jump in their cars and cause problems and they could be going to the danger. We won't tell them always what the danger is. So this site is raked 10 meters from the front to the back. It goes uphill. The people in wheelchairs with walking and mobility issues will not get up there. So I devised a blue egress route to put them there for many reasons. One being that campus drive at the top there is a circle route and I can get them out. The second part to this is I could, if we needed, push everybody to the back. There is more than enough space to put 3,000 people at the back and keep them there and then make a decision with the incident management team. If we have to full on evacuate, notice that assembly two at the top there is actually, it, it is actually a bus drop off area. So I'm gonna send the Akron people across the road so that when their family go and get the cars, they can pick them up. They've all got drives with licenses that they'll all help each other to go and everybody else will go back to their cars and chuff off. The final bit to this is if you haven't, if you don't eat and breathe this stuff, then please take these next two bits in, uh, seriously. Okay, that's a long shot. You can see the five exits to the university. Those are the four assembly points and you need a backup or two or three or four. You need to have backups. Backup number two is actually a walkway under the road to the park on the other side. The worst thing that could possibly happen is somebody was to drive a petrol tanker down the road and explode behind the stage. 
we looked at that scenario. Um, trucks are actually barred from going down that street. They've got to go down another one. So that's what we have. It's a brilliant little event. Wonderful to sit there with an orchestra playing or, or a band playing and having the kookaburra singing along all night. And you need to have a run sheet and you need to know what you're doing. So that in a nutshell, possibly a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be, uh, was a real life, is a real life uh, event management plan in pictures. It would have taken me probably three to four weeks to document it. And all I do is I work with the pictures because they're not going to pay for three or four files of documentation that's going to sit there. The music at Murdoch actually started with um, the Perth Symphony Orchestra, Brainwave from the amazing Bobby Webster, who was one of the original Bond girls, that string quartet. Um, and was really supported with Glenn Hamilton, who's the events manager. And he's the one who let me play with them for five years and develop all these things to make their job a lot easier. As a little aside, especially for the, the younger people, uh, if you sort of recognize Samantha Jade, but you're not sure. She's Perth born, as I mentioned, but she played Kylie in Kylie the movie. That was the Motown. It was actually raining there. And does this stuff work? I don't know. You tell me. Um, I got a glowing uh, feedback on Twitter a while back, and it was absolutely, uh, uh, I just sat there when I, I, I saw that come in. So, <clears throat> Let's just go from that. We call this the BBL, Big Bash League. You guys, I think, call it the 2020. I don't watch the cricket. I find it really boring. And in a five-day match, test match, I'll probably see two overs. Uh, there was a, an incident in Adelaide uh, about three weeks before this. This was 2006. And uh, we got relocated so that people had no idea we were, where we were. Uh, it's no longer there now. Um, that room. You can see the new stadium in the top right hand corner above this uh, video on the scoreboard and Gloucester Park in the, in the distance. One of the few rooms I actually have um, the view of, of um, the arena, the seating bowl. I just want to zoom in though and show you a dot plan. The little light blue dots are deliberately faded because of they, um, just for operational reasons, and I broke it down into zones, and I've developed a numbering system to help people. That's a webinar in its own in itself, um, but it works for me, and I'll tell you the story in a second when I get to Perth Racing. Uh, across the road at the, the rectangular field, we call it soccer, you call it football. I was actually paid to put this together. They don't use it anymore. Uh, which is a shame, but I color coded everything. Hotel was the bar, Sierra is the operations teams, Romeo the response, and it worked really well. But if you fast forward, now have a look at that, go back. From this, I was working at the race course. I got ahead, headhunted to work at Ascot race course, and we had call signs based on static security, which was Sierra 1 to Sierra 275. We had six A3 sheets with the information. And if Sierra 191 called in, we would have to go looking. No standard methodology. Now you've had a sneak peek. 192 positions, all with their call signs on the dot. So if there's a problem in the mounting yard, which is in the middle, I could tell you that Hotel 1 should be calling it in. Hotel 9, Hotel 10, Hotel 5, and Hotel 4, 4, 4 are the closest guards. And I've got all my response teams to go as well. I do not need to look at a piece of paper to figure it out. I know that Golf 6-0 is gate 6, which is on the right. I know that Golf 2-1 is at gate 2, which is right in the middle there. I know that Hotel 2 is at the admin because it works. And those of you who use um, call signs, Charlie is the corporate area, Golf is the gates, Hotel is the horses, which here takes priority over everything. I'll zoom you in and have a bit of fun with you here. <clears throat> and I'm going to mix up a lot of things. This is a picture taken out of Google Earth Pro. I did put it out on, on, on cyberspace. The taxis normally park at the green bit. But the moment they get to the red bit, one car blocks that whole road. And when they get to the left of the red bit, it blocks the whole road again. 
and it goes back to the main gate. The problem then is the first taxi moves, and I can tell you now, it's 120 taxis will then all move forward one car length, and it causes us a problem, okay? So on the left, one car, an Uber, could come along and stop to pick someone up because they've got a fare, and they can block a whole road four kilometers. On the right, though, there's a little innovative thing, which I got nominated for Employee of the Year for developing. And it looks like this. And Mark, by the way, loves the pink taxi. Female driver, preferred uh, passengers are female. So we will pull her out of the queue if we have a request for a female, female driver. And there's 120 taxis, all parked, ready to road, load eight at once, take them off, fill them up, the system works, and how does it work? I show them the pictures. Now I could talk about this for hours, it's fascinating, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna show you. So, road closures go in place. The area that is of attention is actually the green bit put everything in place and each one of these sheets, these screens can be used as an A4 laminated document. So the taxis need to come in, go around, park, and then go to where the taxi rank is. And then they leave through there and they come this way. If they're going to Midland or the airport direction, they go that away. And if they're going to Perth, they go that away. We don't need to put traffic management plans in place. So then what we've got, shuttle buses. There are three, that area holds three. They bring the fourth one along. When that's at the back, the first one goes. Charter vehicles drive me nuts at the end, but we lay them off over there and they've realized that if the punters walk across to there, they can take off. Ride share, they do their own thing. So give them the pin for this, bring them in, drop them off, turn them around, go out the second entry exit, and off they chuff. I could write this down, but it would take forever. But I'm showing you the pictures. So public parking, yeah. <clears throat> we have to use the cars to get to this facility. So there's the first parking, there's the overflow, and off they chuff as well, which is really good. So the red area on the right there is the working area, the horses and uh, the trailers and the floats are over there. The yellow bit is the, the jockeys. The big one for me is the emergency vehicles, old growth jarrow, wood floors in these buildings. It would go up like the Glasgow School of the Arts did six years ago. We need to get the, the fireys straight in there if we have to. That is fenced off when I'm running this and setting it up like this. And if I need to communicate to anybody over the radio, I know Neil Minter will probably be having kittens looking at this, but <laughs> I can tell you over the radio where I am using the map. That's key locations for that. So let's keep um, going. I think this might go a little bit longer, Mark, than I, I thought it would, but we'll go. Let's shoot across to Saudi. There's the cars. Six months after that picture was taken, Winter Wonderland appeared, 220 hectares. I'm just showing you this because I'm sitting in Perth and I took that picture in Perth, not in Saudi Arabia. I did have the privilege of going over there and I worked on an event and I got to meet Izzy Murphy, Izzy Murphy for the first time at this event. I could tell you about it, but I, a picture's better. That stage on the left has the world record for the tallest temporary structure at 38 meters. Each one of those silver doors is 24 meters, uh, sorry, 12 meters wide, six meters tall. There are 12 of them. They're so heavy, they're on rollers. The wadi down the bottom was actually covered up. They built a bridge over the top, the whole thing to get everybody in and out. I can show you a 2D model, it's boring. You just be looking at the purple area, but I eat and breathe this stuff. So let's keep um, whacking through this and put little people in over a map inside that event. Now at the outset, I didn't do the crowd management plan, Gray McAvoy from GMC did. Um, but if I'm at an event, I will sometimes just play around to see what it's like. And someone told me you couldn't put a lot of people in this particular software, which is 3D RTDS. 
the little number down the bottom is 119,850. Without writing words on a page and looking at things, I am telling a story here. Now, if I flip it round and look from the beast, as she's affectionately called, the crowd are even in Thorpes and Abias. I have to show you the beast because some of you just serious. Three of those I took, and when you've got seven or eight of those um, cranes working at once, you know you're in for a big, big day, a big event. I actually went over to work on the Riyadh season. It's in my blurb. Um, radio supervisor, some amazing, memorable pictures there. Uh, Mark, you did ask about the car last night that uh, did the 19 and a half meter loop. Um, Terry Grant uh, is a stock standard Jaguar SUV, whatever model that is. I'm not into cars. That event was insured for $1.5 billion. That's how much car, many cars there was there. There was, uh, I think, 150 Ferraris alone. Just as a little aside, I said I'd slow it down a bit just for 10 seconds. Sometimes people like this do amazing things, and I'm just in awe that she trusts her team at the bottom. They make it sure that she doesn't die because she goes a hell of a lot higher than that. So she's up in the air. You have to get into the air to come back to Perth. So let's come to the Perth arena. And there it is. I can see triangles. I can see diamonds. And I can see hexagons and rhombus. And that is what's called tessellation. This is in my back door. If you look closely, you can see the biohazard symbol. But if you look more closely, um, and Heide Ben Crab and his, his, his girls, uh, his family, they're watching on the big TV. That's a map of Australia. And the red and white pole is actually the border where we're keeping the coronavirus out. And if you look at Western Australia, it's a diamond. I say that because it's important that you know that. Now, Perth Arena is there from the roof. If you look to the right hand side, you can actually see still some concrete footing down the bottom of the screen just near the road. And what a lot of people don't realize is you could do this in Google Earth. You can go back in time. That's the Perth Entertainment Centre, where as a second year uni student, I walk through the doors to work my first shift with a crowd. Now I work two back-to-back -back Elton John concerts because the back then, those of you who know how it used to work, they used to end the world tours or the Australian leg of the tour in Perth so they could pack everything up, put it on ships and get it to Singapore or Japan. So I worked uh, at the end of four world tours with Elton John. I've seen him 15 times. I've looked after him in his dressing room and I've even played his piano on stage. I've done over 3,000 concerts and events and I've had the opportunity to work around the world and was planning to be at Glastonbury this year and back in Saudi Arabia, but mm, I can still work from here. I put this out last year at exactly the same time I started my shift 40 years ago. I put myself through uni and some people talk about their qualifications and everything. All I'll say is this, two undergrad in psychology, behavioral and social psych, postgrad in education, training, human resource development, lecturing as well in management and operations. And I do love looking at operations from a heuristic point of view. Once upon a time, I just joke about looking so young and whatever. Now, especially putting this webinar together, clearly I am proud of the fact I've done 40 years in this business. Those of you who are born in the last 20, 25 years may not know what we do and why we do it. But that date at the top is significant because five days before this happened. I didn't know at the time. Have a good look at the picture because yes, have a good look at that picture because yes, they are body bags. Mums and dads, brothers and sisters, nephews, niece, grandkids went to a concert and 11 of them came home in a coffin. And the sheer force of that crowd crush was such that their shoes and their clothes came off in that area. 
Now, some good has come out of that. The coroner's report was typed on a typewriter. I have a copy here. And many recommendations have been implemented. So if you're new to the industry and you go, oh, crowd management, oh, well, yeah, it's just something you do. Let's move on. This is what we do and why we do it. I'm going to shoot forwards 30 years to the 4th of April, uh, sorry, to the 9th of uh, April 2009. I was invited to look after the corporate VIP at this particular location. You're not allowed to take photos during um, an event because it's a sackable offence. But when the crowd left, I have to, I have to, I have to, I'll, I'll lose my job. I don't care if I get caught. Because you see, 30 years later, the who turned up in my back door. And I spent all night trying to figure out how to get the laminates. It's only the little things, but hey, you can see where my life is actually following the evolution of crowd management. One of the bestest things that I ever did. So I said I'd take it down. Now I'm going to slowly build it up a bit. I want to fast forward another 10 years. Take you back to summer 2019, 2020. We had bushfires. If you've never been through a bushfire, the heat can be so intense that it will boil the oil in a eucalyptus tree and it will explode. It even makes the weather formation, it actually play, creates its own weather formation and sucks the oxygen in. And that's why you can't put these things out. This one, I promised you I would do it a few weeks ago. I know Peter Ward picked up on it. Uh, Neil Minter, pay attention. Neil Dinnery, uh, Matt Dinnery, pay attention. Ben Crabb, okay, Ian Mixter. We're ready to go because I'm going to take you inside the New South Wales Incident Command Post and show you the one person who oversaw that emergency. There he is, Shane Fitzsimmons. Note, he's not looking at a map on a wall. He's not sitting at a computer. He's standing at a touch screen, touch screen monitor. We live in a 3D world. We draw maps in 2D. We put 2D maps on the wall at the right angle to the world. Wouldn't it be great if everything was oriented the way he's got it? You can already get holographic projectors. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. They're using that as the vehicle to look at everything else. This gentleman here is the deputy. They're making a point. They're not arguing. They're focusing on the fact. They're not saying he said, she said. He goes out of the way because lives are at stake here. And they're looking at screens these screens, not CCTV screens. The, okay, we are now looking at, we're looking at, um, we're looking at the um, future of the industry. Artificial intelligence is kicking in. We're looking at pictures. We're looking at maps. We're using data to predict things. If you want to get into artificial intelligence, um, I got connected with uh, Naomi Rose through Rupert Bassadoni. Uh, she's into this stuff. Guys, hire her, give her a job, help her build a business because this is the way of the future. And last uh, couple of weeks, I was on a webinar in um, uh, the Hajj and uh, the associate professor actually said that basically the Hajj in the future will be screens like this. The life of a CCTV operator is 20 minutes paying attention. If they're sitting there 10 hours, they're not watching stuff. They can't. And it's reactive. This is proactive. This is using information to tell a story. So I'll just step you through some of my evolution using pictures so you can see how it works. So there's a couple of things. Some of the tools I use are out there commercially. Keynote, PowerPoint. I use Keynote because it works on an iPhone, an iPad, and iPod and all that sort of stuff. I don't have to change it. PowerPoint has a few little hiccups. You can even record webinars with your picture on them if you want. I uh, also use Google Earth Pro, Google Maps, Google My Maps. They're all free. Google Earth Pro used to be $400. Let me just shoot you back 10 years. On the right, Peter Dalton will re recognize this. Um, on the right, I plotted in Google My Maps, Roskilde. I've never been there. Parents really good. The orange tent, it was wonderful. And I didn't take a screenshot. Oh my goodness. Talk about moment, right? Absolutely spewing. 
As some of you know, because I've actually shared stuff with you, materials with you, I um, play around in Google Earth Pro. Now, I do three types of presentations. The Emerald, which is predominantly still pictures and some videos. The Ruby, I will go live and show you this stuff. And the Diamond is more for academics and some theories and stuff amongst a closed group of like-minded people or restricted classified information. So what I did for this, you could take the data from Google My Maps and you put it into Google Earth Pro, which is on the left. And any wonder that on Friday, when that image popped up in Peter Dalton's thing and he said, does anybody know where it is? I've never been there. I know the site because I found my picture. That is the image I regretted not taking, but I don't need to because it's there in the universe forever. And if you want to see an amazing event and think of logistics and just how it all works, the transport people, the cleaning people, you know, the food, the waste, the, the logistics alone, it's just mind blowing. It's there for you to look at. How do I do it? It's free, Google Earth Pro. I took this picture the other day with a window open. If you look on the left, any event that happens in the world or any event I work on, I plot it or drop a pin so I don't have to go looking. I've got the folder open for Overseas UK Europe. OK, and I'm spot on the time there, Mark, so I don't think I need to, to speed it up. Um, if you look there, the Avazine cycling tour, Stephen O'Neill did that one. Bergen, you're going to see that at the end. Boston Marathon, had a bit of fun with Mark last night, showing him what's painted on the road at the beginning and the end of the Boston Marathon. Dublin Marathon, St. Patrick's Day in Dublin, London, the London Underground, every train track, every station. I can click that button and show you where to go. If I was a terrorist, no, I'm not. Right, the People's Vote Parades, Wembley Stadium. We'll come to Wembley in a second. So... Oh. I'll just go back there right so i was going there i clicked the button too fast but that's okay stuff happens what if four events happen at once now i'm back in my hometown here the train tracks came to me courtesy of google the train stations came to me of google all the locations came to me with from google all the lines that you see in color are mine let me show you what can happen so i will revisit this in, in about five minutes so basically, if these four events all happened at once, what would happen to the infrastructure? What would happen to the uh, public transport system? You've got the cricket ground there, the whacker, the, the trots are usually at night. You've got HBF Park uh, where the soccer uh, is, is held. You've got the Perth Arena, 15,000, you've got 30,000. Could the city cope? Well, let me show you a couple of things, especially for the students who are joining us. This is how my mind works. What was that? Okay, it's all right. This is how my mind works. So this is Belmont Park race course. This no longer is an issue. The red area is a construction site. The preferred way for people to walk from the train station and over and back across to Optus Stadium is the green line. But there was a construction in place. So the, red, the cars go down the red route and people are going to take the yellow line because that's the path of least resistance. There is no footpath. It is the most dangerous. There is a solution to this. It's a case study. I'll happily work with the lecturers and run it in your in your class, your event management classes to show people that it's this simple. Build it into a model, get the site plan, reduce it to a schematic, use the crowd management tools, ramp analysis, dim ice, test your model. There's a schematic of the, exactly what you were just looking at. There's the path of least resistance. I am not going to show you the solution. OK, some of you will go, oh, it's obvious. It's not obvious to a lot of people. Trust me. Now, at the outset, I've said it before and I will say it again, but this time I'm going to be venue specific. Optus Stadium is a one point six billion dollar stadium that was built on my doorstep three years ago. I do not do the crowd management plan for this facility. Companies like Arup and all those high end big venue people do. But if you build a stadium in my back door, I am going to sit here and I'm going to play with it. And I'm going to show you what about 100 hours of my, my life could create. Here are the ingress routes, the egress routes. So in is green, red is out, yellow is a path of least resistance or um, part of the egress just because to make the colors a little easier. Purple are the paths of least resistance. I can switch them on, switch them on at any time. 
And if I press this button, people walk over there from the top from Belmont Park and go to the event as well. Tools you can use. Have a look at this tourism picture. Okay. This is an aerial view looking towards the Elizabeth Key Boat Harbour, which I'll mention a little bit later when I visit Trafalgar Square. In Google Earth Pro, you can match it like this. So if I can do that now, I don't normally show this, but because I'm amongst colleagues and friends, okay, I've already pre-recorded sections where to go and what height. So I could look at the Sky Show when 300,000 people come here to watch the fireworks on, on um, Australia Day, then basically I, I could just press a button and drop down and have a look at the terrain, not live, okay? That's a surprise later. What does it look like? Well, here we go. You tell me. 300,000 people. The first major airport is actually this Langley Park area, 105 hectares. Okay, the Red Bull Air Race, the last two took off there and landed. Straight there, boom, up in the air, race, come back down. Elizabeth Boat Harbour here. I'm not going to redo the picture with the current one. 60,000 people up in Kings Park. The beauty of doing this is you can use exactly the same information and files, data files, graphic, inf what do you call it? GIS files for other events like Anzac Day. You have Remembrance Day overseas, a lot of you, Victory in Europe and Japan and whatever. I was booked to do Anzac Day this year, and then COVID came along. There are six maps on there. I can click them on and off, and in a Ruby, I would do it and show you how it all works. There's the map for Kings Park, where the majority of the ceremony is. They then move to the smaller map in the middle, which is then the parade, and then the smaller map again, and they have a sausage sizzle and a barbecue at the end. The bigger map on the right is the transport map for people going to the stadium. You can see Belmont Park Racecourse has got a map over there and down near Harrison Island in the middle there between East Perth and Burswood. There's a map there which I can then zoom into, which you've already seen part of the, um, for the long weekend for the, the um, SOTA Festival. So if you've got the whole thing plotted, you could do things. Now, this came to me by a very special person. I'm not going to say what the event is. It doesn't matter. But I've never been to Trafalgar Square ever ever. I went to London once, got out from Gatwick at Victoria Station, went up, saw all these people and went, there's too many people, I've got to get out of here. Who would have thought a crowd manager? Anyway, what you can do is you can take a CAD drawing and you can put it into a picture like this. I draw your attention that if you know which buttons to press, you can follow the terrain. Notice the steps going up to the National Art Gallery. Also, the CAD people are looking at all their little purple lines going, geez, they match the road and the route and everything. Well, it damn well should. It's deadly accurate. Now, I ran into some of this past Mark last night, and he was asking me questions, the very questions I'm answering, like, what does it really look like? Well, even last week, the satellite went over and took a picture. It tells me a few things. It's not very busy, but that's COVID. But I'm a crowd manager. My brain then asked what Mark did last night is, I wonder what it would look like with a crowd. It took me less than 10 seconds to find this. Then I looked at that crowd, and Mark did last night, and we went, he went to me, what's the crowd? That's not a normal configuration. What happened in December 2006? 10 seconds on a computer. This is what happened in December 2006, the 23rd of December, to be exact. So you need pictures, you need maps. Here's some other maps. I just want to thank you. Uh, St. Martin in the Fields is up here. Um, 12 of the bells, you know, the nursery rhyme, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Lemons. The second verse, the bells of St. Martin's in the Fields, they're in that bell tower in our heart, uh, the Betty Boat Harbour, as we call it. It is a book key boat harbour. You sent 12 of them over here in 1988. For that, we thank you. We've got a tourist attraction because of you. I take all the words out of this. This is not my map, but you know what's really, really fascinating? And those of you who work in control rooms and those of you who don't have big budgets, let me think. Um, I'll just have a look at my clock here. All right, so it's uh, it's about lunchtime, 12 o'clock over there. Um, it's about 12 o'clock over there. So what I wanna do is uh, Trafalgar Square. I mean, what's happening over there? 
it's, oh, bus going to, uh, that's going to be, where's that one going? Piccadilly Circus? Um, you know what? Let's take a long shot. Wow. If I had a crowd in Trafalgar Square and I'm over here in Perth and I'm tapping into your cameras to look at your tourist features and the crowd, then you can too. Now, if you Skype me, if you Skype me, um, I'm usually doing it in the music room and I quite often sit at the grand piano, hence the keys. So here's how this works. I just want to take you on a lightning tour just to, as we build up for the end. Come over to Sydney Harbour, it's somewhere on the river. It's dark at the moment. The video version of this is absolutely, you can go live, you can watch it. This is what it looks like in the daytime. Come over to where I live, Scarborough Beach, which is nowhere near the river. The sun went down earlier. I took a picture from a camera on a hotel that moves around looking at the surf all day. I looked after an event down there. Are you ready for this? Eight security, six and a half thousand surf athletes, 10 days, 52 events. And we monitored some of the event from this camera. We go over to Dublin. Now, Dublin, who spotted this on LinkedIn? Okay, I've been reliably informed that you don't go to this part of Dublin. <sighs> but let's have a look. Now, I could go live, but um, there's not a lot happens sometimes. But Croke Park's out of action because like there's nothing happening there. So let me just show you and have a bit of fun that here's someone on the other side of the world tapping into your events, your venues, and there are cameras in stadiums you can tap into. This woman at 5.30 in the morning is taking pictures. Do not ask me why, apart from the fact she's in Ireland. The temple bar there, built in 1840. How do I know? Because I've been down to the street and had a look, because there's a lot happens in this street. Even at night, it even rains. People put their umbrellas up and they go out. This guy did the pharmacy, did the cleaning for the pharmacy. I was a bit bored one night and I was watching him. The police go around, or the garter, and so do the ambulances. I'm doing all this from my house my office my wherever i even showed people how to do this when i was in a hotel the other day working on the front line for the covid 19. and then there's nothing happens and they go to sleep now it's daytime over there and oh mark can you pop down and clean the no nah, don't worry events happen in every shape and form and i watched this it's a week and a half ago if anybody knows them congratulate them please happy bride happy couple She's got no idea I was watching her toast her wedding. And she's got no idea that her wedding album is on the internet. So what have we got? We're nearly there. So Times Square is between two rivers, 5.30 in the morning. That's what it looks like. Quarter to nine in the morning because of COVID. That's what it looks like. Quarter past nine on a Saturday night. Are you serious? Now. I'm drawing your attention to this because I've got a little lesson in crowd management here. People go out on New Year's Eve. I don't know why. People go to Times Square to watch a ball drop. I don't get the ball thing. Why not stay at home and watch the people watching the ball drop? 2019, it looked like this. 40,000 people go and watch the ball drop, which it just has at this point. Now, as a crowd safety manager, I'm looking for clusters and bubbles. Well, in the control room, I'm looking for bubbles and clusters, really, because if you can see a bubble, there's usually a cluster formed and topic for another day. Dirk Helbing's work from the late 1990s. Let's go forward another seven or eight minutes. If you look under the Pele sign and you look to the right, you can actually see little areas opening up. The parallax of vision, the vision parallax, anything in the top half of the screen, you cannot see because of the distances get compressed. Go for exactly another five minutes. I'm happy, I'm happier. Why? Because let's go another five minutes. I can see lots of bubbles. This is what crowd scientists do. You follow the timeline around the world. It's just me. That's, oh, it's just me. <laughs> okay. But this is the, uh, the best way for a uh, crowd scientist to go around the world. Okay, let me just kill that one. And it's OK, we're pressing buttons. We don't want to lose vision. Now, Professor Stell still came over here last year and um, he uh, ran a couple of um, 
uh, he ran a workshop and invited me to assist and I, I showcased a couple of things. I'll go through this one, these two very quickly, just to show you what you can do. A participant came to me, he was from Brisbane and he said, I haven't been to Brisbane for 30, well, 32 years, 42 years. And he said, I've got a problem with this bridge, the Victoria Bridge. I said, oh yeah, what's the problem? He said, how many people can you put on it so they can watch the fireworks from here at the other end and what's the safe capacity? So we ran some numbers. We ran some numbers. <clears throat> now, normally I would then flick this into a model, a schematic model, but I'm going to leave it on for you. It's going to be very fast just to give you a, a taster. So people turn up by bus. There's a bus depot to the right. The train station is off the screen. The road is fenced in the middle. The spectators arrive like that. Then they have to close it off and coordinate and they push the overflow down. Switch it across the 3D RTDS. There are seven cameras on there. Zach Kelly, who thought there was problems with cameras. No, there isn't. Okay, you change the angle, you put the people in and have a look at the density and the capacity. What is the capacity on that bridge? Like I'm gonna tell you, come on, do the maths. No, it's an activity, it's a case study. Hey, I'll come and do it for you, for uni students. But have another look at density, match the camera angle with Google Earth Pro, Pro and fly around. Have a look, see what's happening. Make the real world problems live and make it live using pictures, animations and movement. Shoot across to Scotland. I've been to Murrayfield Stadium. Apparently it's the home of rugby. Oh, I have only been close, close as the train track, right? It's the closest I've been, 2014 and 1984. I'm not gonna change the pictures, but that construction area is um, now complete. Don't ask me about the crowd management plan here. I didn't devise it. I'm just playing with uh, for Fabio De Stefano um, knows this better. So does Alistair, Alistair Duncan. So you can see what we can do with this stuff. I'm telling a picture and I actually, by putting this together, know this place better than some people do because I, in fact, you can actually match the CCTV cameras. Put it together, overall picture. Um, I hope Eric Kant's here because I do want to publicly thank him. Eric Kant last year um, sent me this picture from an international conference. That's my picture on a screen being presented by Professor Steele. No bigger honor than that. CCTV cameras, there's one I spotted earlier. And that's the angle and the image that I need to work from. Okay, so here we're going. It's really freaky not being able to hear people. This one's for all you football nerds and queuing people. There are 127 football stadiums in the Great Britain. Over 40 of them were designed by Albert Leach, the Glaswegian engineer. Now, this, this question appeared on LinkedIn on Friday. Eulopaths, you go on the edges. Hamilton paths, you go with roots. Now, what is a Hamilton path? A Hamilton path is basically something where you do not double back or cross your route. So at an event, I want to go to the toilet, I want to get my food, I want to get a drink, I want to buy some merch, and then I want to get back to my, my, my area. One-way routes may not necessarily do it. Think Hamilton paths. You go shopping, you go in, you get the bread, you go and you get the bananas, you go across and you get the greens, then you go to get the milk, you get the meat, and if you're male, you get the hell out of there. I can't put 127 names on. I did last night for, for, for Mark. We shot down to a few of them. There's 14 of them. I must say, I did, used to support Leeds United. <clears throat> They've just gone up. And uh, sad to see that both Bobby, Bobby Charlton and Jackie Charlton in the last uh, few years have, have passed on. Uh, now, is it is possible to visit them all? The rules are no crossing, no routes are doubling back. The answer obviously is yes. And what it looks like is that. I spent hours, no, I didn't, okay. The question now comes up is, those of you who've got fancy motorbikes who want to visit every single stadium in the UK, Ian Mixter, off we go. You need enough fuel to get you 3,022.7 kilometers. If you're into football stadiums, if I was doing this live, I would go down to any stadium you want. The software is on the website with Safe Software Canada, FML Safe Software, and someone has put it together because computers do the work for you. It would be remiss of me not to visit Wembley Stadium. Those are my lines plotted on Google Earth Pro. You can switch it around, right? 
I should mention here at this point that the crowd management plan uh, in there is still being used, was designed by Emma Parkinson, Andy Hollinson, Professor Keith Still and Professor John Jury and Ian Mixter. I wanted to bring him on today, but you know what? Let's do that for another day and have a lot of fun. The other thing that's important is <clears throat> I've been looking for the Holy Grail for weeks and last week I was walking past this, which I have for like six weeks, and I discovered I suddenly looked at this and went, if this was the seating ball and I could put all the pictures in and all the tools and everything, and I could just pull them out, they're all up to date, then I don't need all these files. If you also look on the outside of the bowl, you can see triangles and diamonds and hexagons and rhombus and everything else. So I think I found the Holy Grail and I've been playing with it for a week, courtesy of James Millendall putting me in touch with Joe Custon, the designer. Used at Expo 2020 and Doha 2022, amongst others. Event management plans in pictures. That's CAD drawings on there. That's not JPEGs. And it's absolutely amazing to play with. That's London 2012 plotted in there. A couple of other things I'm going to go to very quickly. And I am conscious of the time, but I'm not going to cut it out. Some dude in Ireland um, tweeted this. If you're going to tell me you've got 127 high HIK vision cameras, and in the article, you tell me they're hooked into the internet. I'm going to go looking for them. Why? Because they could help me with my events. You never know. Never been there. Paul, right, Paul from Actavis office is over there on the left uh, for me. That's to the left. Uh, you know, Save Events is on the right. It's a gastro pub. That's where it is. The internet is doing all the work for me. Now I've switched over. There's a sign on the door that says CCTV cameras are in use. There's a camera. There's another camera. Can you see the Google thing? <laughs> so there's a picture of Google taking a picture of Google, and I'm taking a picture of them taking a picture of a CCTV camera. The question is, where is it? That's one. There are another 126. Very quickly, Mark did mention about using videos and things. He doesn't know I've done this, right? I did this years ago. It is on my YouTube channel. But St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin, for the first half of the route uses exactly the same route as the Dublin LGBTQ Pride Parade. <clears throat> it's quite good to the music, but that's the schematic. Ends in Merrion Square. They both start here at the church, the assembly point, and they go down the main drag strip. Now, we're, go we're heading down here, and on the right, you will actually come across the post office that in 1918 was... Uh, the center of the Easter parade. I did the commemorative service 100 years on with the Perth Symphony Orchestra. There it is on the right. There are bullet holes in the wall if you want to drop down and have a look. Okay. St. Patrick's Day goes across the bridge to the right. You go to the left. If I hadn't done this, I wouldn't know that there's a train track here. Okay. I wouldn't know there's a train track here. We go around the corner and then we you get the idea. So you can speed this up. You can drop down to street level. You can go high. You can do all sorts of things. Um, and if you're still with us, that's really good. I'm conscious uh, people have commitments. Those train bridges, if you were a terrorist, you'd be looking at that. A bit of a pinch point here, but it's manageable. You come around the corner and then party time because we finish up there and we go into the park. The other thing you could do is count your crowds and you need to know your capacities. Okay. Um, Andrew C drew this on his phone when the, uh, the Hong Kong riots, pro the protest marches were on in London. Did that on his phone. I woke up the next morning. I plotted the routes. Okay. Professor still sent me a data sheet from, from Reuters. You do that. I'd already plotted my version, which is that. You can fly around the whole area, and that's what we do when we are um, not doing much on a, on a Sunday morning. Here we go. Was well, my mouse? There we go. Just has to give me the mouse back. So, <clears throat> hang on a second. Give me two seconds. Right. Okay. A couple of little tools you might want to use. Right. Here's my phone. It's telling me I've been going just a fraction over an hour. So we're nearly there, which is good. I said it would be tight. Um, <clears throat> there we go. There's my phone. That's the screen. Some apps you may want to use. These were lifesavers when I went to Saudi Arabia. Communication, I'll get it ready. And emergencies, locations. 
In fact, I won't. I'll just do that. So, translate languages, absolutely tool, a tool to a wonderful tool to use. This one here. Well, let me put it like this. I'll just do this for a second. It's distracting me. Um, Citizen Aid, you may know of. You can get the wallet cards. They're um, a pound ninety nine. The money goes to the uh, Great Ormond's Children Hospital. What three words plus three word photos? Google Earth, Google Map, whatever. Okay, that's the names. That's what you need to do. But I'll just shut this off. Switch it on. When people wear masks, we cannot see their lips. We need to know what they are saying. Very useful tool if you're communicating with people hard of hearing. A couple of other little things that we need to do, apart from keep people safe, is locate people. So my daughter, um, I was working. I spotted this picture. It's a beautiful tree. I sent the picture to my daughter. She sent me a picture back within 60 seconds and said, Dad, is that the tree? That's where the tree is. We need to locate people. One of the original trees planted for the early settlers. Three weeks ago, it was Father's Day. Now, I want to show you something really deep here and how you can pinpoint things. This was up on LinkedIn. See the right arm? See the right arm? His right arm. There's a grate in the yellow lines. Those of you looking at the shirt, I'll save you the trouble. It's a Celtic shirt. Get an overhead shot. Zoom in looking for the grate. You can see it in the yellow line on the left. You can pinpoint that guy with a Google pin, but you can't say that over the radio. So we need to use something else. And I only took this picture last week, but I took it from here. Scary. And last night I took Mark for a tour underneath that road there underneath the stadium from my computer. Now, Mark did say that uh, we'll have a look at a couple of things very quickly. It is going to be fast. I'm not going to debate the issue. But before you leave, if you're still with us, which is brilliant, several of us read this a few weeks ago. It took me an hour and a half to read it and four and a half hours to pull it apart. At the end, you're going to see inside that document in a minute. But at the end, I looked at that picture and I said, I wonder where in the world that is. If I was doing this live, you, you have, um, uh, face to face, you'd be shouting out names. It's in a place called Shrewsbury. Never heard of it. But you can jump down to street level, look at the rubbish bin, line it up, zoom in and match the picture. That should scare people. The content of that document is this. So here we go. In the document, we're talking about physical distancing, queuing, and spaces. This is a diagram in there to um, demonstrate physical distancing um, in a static situation. And then they use this for dynamic. That picture does my head in because the circles are not together. This one does my head in even more because the circles overlap all these gaps. Saying that, if you put them in the same area, there's wasted space. How much? Okay, put the two pictures together and you can see there's some little feet dangling. Now, Megan Kate Taylor, who's a PhD candidate at University of New South Wales, who's also legally blind, has put me onto a few things. One of them is I need to remove the visual white noise. So let's just get that out of here. Let's make the circles exact. Let's be precise here. So that's them standing statically. That's dynamic. Now, I want to suggest that you use this model for static. Some people have already said to me, oh, but what you do is you stagger people. Yeah, but how do you do it? They refer to hexagon circle packing. That's the name you need to look up. Plumbers, landscape gardeners know how to pack things. There's a hexagon. If you can't see the hexagons, right? Six triangles make a hexagon. Seven circles make a hexagon. So how do you do it? If you've got your pens ready, here we go. I will not talk about one meter, one and a half meter, two meters. I will talk about one unit of social distancing. Okay, one meter of social distancing. So you lock one line into position, which is the first line, and then you take every second row and you move them half a unit left. You then move them up. You can figure out how much, you've all got tape measures. Okay, then you move them up quarter of a unit, then you move them across quarter of a unit. 
The reason that we can do this is because the circles are not cylinders. They're not solid. We can chop the edges off them. So we can have someone standing up against a brick wall. The base is there. The number is 16. We have the wasted space. And because I do what I do and I look at things creatively, I can put another four people in there. I couldn't quite believe this last night, but the magic number is 25%. Now, if you're into queues and if you're into people and you want to pack money in because it's the clients who's paying our wages and giving us money, but you want to keep everybody physically distanced, you want to maximize your capacity. So here we go. There was a conversation on LinkedIn about toilets and queuing. It was quite funny. It was very animated. And Stephen O'Neill started it. Blame him because what are you about to experience? You could blame him. And then a couple of weeks later, he sent me this picture. Now, you can't see it in detail. Neither could I. But you do what a crowd manager does. All right? And you zoom in. You crop it. You draw a line around it. You put some circles in. Then you go, this won't work. This will not work this way. So I worked around with it. And I Skyped Steve, uh, Stephen. And I said, look, can you send me... Um, a map and some um, CADs and whatever. So what we did, just so you can see, you don't need to know the place or the location, but you can see there's some cars. That's it. It's in an intersection for whatever reason. And there's a gray area that is a no-go zone. So you drop your squares in, you drop your people in, right? You do your calculations, you have a base, you have the numbers. Okay, so I'll give you a hint. Let's break it down to a schematic. Let's get all the stuff out so we don't get distracted. Let's put the people in and we have 111. What I've just showed you, I'm gonna show you again. So this is what I did with, with, with Steve's thing. Okay, take the longest row, which is at the bottom. Take every second row and move every second row, half a unit to the left. You lose three, it happens. Move them up, you figure out how far. So you really don't need to know. <laughs> I lose nine. That's very careless. I move them half a unit, a quarter of a unit, no, half a unit, whatever it is. You figure it out. It's fairly straightforward. Okay. And I lose seven. And then what happens is Mark last night said, it, everybody else says who will look at this, but what about that space there? And I said, how many you, can you put in there? And you're all guessing. And the answer is, ladies and gentlemen, you can put another 20. So let's get rid of a few things. In fact, you've now got 124, you're up 13 people, you're up 12% and that's magic. If I can put 12% more people in your area, you are gonna pay me maximum dollars. You're gonna throw stuff at me. So let's get rid of the red ones because they're redundant and I can see a couple of spots to put a couple of green ones. I've now got it up to 14%. I've got it up to 14%. So. That's when me and Mark had a bit of a chat last night. I said, but you know what? You know what? I actually guaranteed Steve 20%. I did. I did. Watch this. Start from scratch. The word for today is allometry. I just want you to know that. Allometry. The physical shape of a body in a space. So let's have a look at this yellow line. I'm going to change it to square it off at the top. And I'm going to put... A center line in so these red ones are not going to appear the shape that i'm going to use is not an equilateral triangle it is not a square it is not a circle it is a rhombus on its side it is a diamond every side is the same one standard unit for physical distancing in this case i've brought it big to just show you that i can put 16 in there and allometry i'm interested with covid 19 nose to nose to nose Put them all in the place. Note that some of the circles are over the edges. That's fine. It doesn't matter. So what are we after here? Another eight, another 10. Would you be happy with 130, 132? Are you counting them? So what are we going for? Well, let's have a look. If I was going to draw them all out, the solution is diamonds. There's 111, there is the 126 we had. We now have, ladies and gentlemen, 138. 
we're up 27 and we've just slotted an extra 25% physically distanced people in that area. And I would like to thank Stephen for gifting me this. What I want you to do is stare at the number 76 and 85 in the middle. This is not about the pretty shapes. This is not about the mathematics. It is about the people. And these particular people, if they get the bug, will die. They are all distanced. You will need that break to digest things. Two things to finish off with. Pictures tell a story. Now, Martin from Bergen in Norway had a problem. He sent me an email nine months ago, said, hey, can you show me how to use Google Earth Pro to so I can show the band that they can't get a truck into my venue? I said, send it to me, I'll gift it to you because it will take me longer to show you how to do it than to do it. I sent him a file that was six kilobytes. This video of this is on the internet, so I'm gonna rip it. The elevation is 40 meters. It's 808 meters long this route. And let's just go have a look. Why? Because we can. We're talking about a semi-trailer, you call it articulated lorries, going down a residential street, down here, around here, past parked cars, especially late at night, going down here 40 meters to an area that is a cul-de-sac to a thousand seater venue, that on the other side has got a tram track with electric wires and seven lanes of road. He showed it to the client and went, whoa, I can go back up if you want. I believe I'm the only crowd manager in the world at the moment who is using Google Earth Studio. I got vetted to be able to use it. And I'm using this, real live data, and I can change the camera angles and everything else. I gifted Martin the gift that he gifted me so I could show you this Art Deco theater in the other side of the world. So that was that one. Let's give me two secs. That's that one. Here we go. All right. And the final thing I said I would finish and end with coming back to my house, Perth, where I live, my home. Four events at once. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to show you. <clears throat> the video version is on the internet, on my YouTube channel. So there's the train tracks all came to me courtesy of Google. The venues, courtesy of Google. Burswood Peninsula is going to be the blue area on the right. Okay, I hand plotted that whole thing. I did the emergency evacuation calculations for this venue, in the town of Victoria Park. Green is the preferred route, red is not. Across the road, 20,000 people for three days. The green is the preferred route. Trust me, the yellow and the red route is just a nightmare to walk. The car parks are the pink. When we, move, we zoom back down again, it's two kilometers from here to there. How do I know? Because I've measured it. We go across to Belmont Park. You've already visited it. You can see what's happening. If someone had the database of all these events together and put them together, we could have a great discussion in the events command post about what happens. Train tracks, designated stadium train station, and the egress routes from that station. Zoom back out, and you can see that this could have a huge impact, especially if the Wacker was going at HBF Park. So. On the weekend, two football games at this stadium. Whoops, at this stadium, right? If you want to know what the COVID-19 physical distance plan was, it was every second row. It was that simple. I would like to thank you, Mark, for uh, hosting these, Paul from Actavo, Steve for the gift, Ian for being a bit of fun. Watch out for the Wembley Stadium. And I want to pay special attention because he's got it up on the big screen with his family. Ben Crabb for being my test dummy on for me showing you that version of the model. There is a deeper model later on. I'm Alan Wilson and I love crowds. Mark? You are Alan Wilson and you definitely do love crowds. Um, thank you very much for that. Sorry, I'm, I'm watching lots of private oh. messages um, and stuff come up. Where people are saying they're annoyed they oh, to leave. Thank you, Alan. Good. Very visual. Throw Sabbath money. Lab. Throw money. <laughs> um, Whoops, don't, worry what, don't worry what's just um, happened on your screen. If it did, if it didn't, then good. <laughs> yeah, where's he gone? Whoops. Well, yeah, no, I don't. Anyway, if you want you to. can edit that oh, bit no, out. We, call, we can edit that bit out. Just, yeah. Oh, listen, we, we, no, I'm not going to bother editing that bit out. 
that's going to be three seconds to pull out. I'll have to go find it. It'll take me ages. Yeah, I know. So let's, in a, in a um, spirit of moments, right, because I could tell you right now, let me just get this up, okay? Because I have to. Hang on. This is the problem. I've got a little problem. Where's Where's Mark? Are you there? I'm here. Oh, okay. What is your little problem? We're all we're all looking at you having a little problem, but we don't know what your problem is. No, no, it's, it's, it's all right. I'm ready for the second bit. So I I was going to not screen share, but I'm ready for the second bit. So shall we do the break now, or you you want to sum up? Um, you... no, no. I think we can do that. We can do the break now. I think some people naturally, as expected, have to leave, and they're saying yep. thank you and all that. And um, for anyone That's hanging right. around, there is a second part to this. Um, so Alan with is going question to, and answers. With, yeah. with question and answers, if you have anything you want to ask, a few questions have come in. Um, so yep. Alan's going to start the second part of this, which starts with a small break. If anyone wants to get up and stretch the legs, which I'm definitely going to do. I am um, too. And we will be we will be back then. And remember, there is still the debut of Alan's Chevron queuing system to come, um, which will be at the end end. So if you don't need to leave, hang around. Uh, this bit will be fun. Yep. Okay. Can you kill my microphone, um, my stuff from that end, Mark? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay, you can still hear me. They're killed now, and I'm going to kill mine now too, so you can take over that screen. I think Alan's just logged himself out of the room trying to get his uh, his second session to start up there. Um, I'll give him a couple of minutes to jump back in. Um, I, I, I'm i struggling to keep up with the messages, both publicly and privately. Um, thank you to everyone who's really enjoyed Alan's presentation so far. Um, I did tell him, and he had this so well-timed, I did tell him that when you do it live, it will definitely run longer. So he has built the majority of the value into the first half which we, well, it's more than the half, but which we've now finished. So he does have a plan for a second session. There he is back in the room. I can see that. You can't. So he does have a plan for the second session. So we're going to start a break, which will be about 10 minutes. Um, if, as he said earlier on, you choose to come back about six and a half minutes in, it may be worth your while doing that. He has something thrown in there. Um, and then we're going to get into the the second session uh, which will involve uh, Q and A, um, as well as the the Chevron queuing system that Alan has been talking about. So I think, from what I can see, he's teeing that ten minute countdown up now. So I shall shut up. Um, and uh, Alan, if you're ready, I've just filled the gap there. So I'm yeah, going to turn myself okay. off and off we go. Yep. All right.
Okay, don't worry, folks. There wasn't uh, there wasn't sound on that video, so you're all right. Um, Alan and I were just uh, setting some other things up in the background, so you probably heard little bits of noise, but there was no sound on that video. For anyone who didn't catch it entirely, I would definitely suggest uh, catch up with that one on the recording. It's a fascinating piece of work around how to set up uh, temporary toilets for male and female, um, and it, it's from Ghent University that that Alan uh, included there. It's about three and a half minutes. Definitely worth having a look at. Um, Alan, if you're ready, take over and I will disappear on you. Well, no, it's question time, isn't it? I, my wife my wife did work then? Yes. No, no, it did, it did. Okay, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. All right. Yeah, no, that's good. Just that's... Make sure that's worked. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, um, because those of you who don't know, I've got two screens. I prefer to have four and I can't find the webinar jam browser. So it's, it's caused me a little bit of X. <laughs> so I can't actually see you at the moment. So basically... Um, I'll just have a bit of fun with you at the beginning. I am going to end the question section with the three um, pink areas at the bottom. Capacities, how to mark out the area that I showed you before with diamonds and then the uh, world premiere of the Chevron queuing system. A little hint with the pictures of the pinks. There are squares in there, there are circles, there are diamonds, there are rhombus and there are hexagons in those pictures, if you can see them. Just remember this, only squares, triangles and hexagons um actually tessellate nothing else does and that's the clue for us all but what i thought i would do is have a bit of fun and go back to dublin <clears throat> just to show you if you're visual you can actually do things in, in a in a fun way um <laughs> i spotted this the other day because there's nothing else happening in perth it's a bit sleepy at the moment um, but those horses are looking in the right direction you need to share your screen again oh sorry no no you're fine oh, I'm just thinking at the minute everyone's looking at you and me, but that's it. So you need to share that screen. I click, hang on, hang on. I click the button. All right. So just give me two secs. Yeah, no worries. That's all right. Let me go back then. There's Let me go back. So much tech, tech involved in this one. No, no, it's right. All right. So they didn't see this. That's okay. I love you all. Shit happens. We get on with it. We're events <laughs> no, they didn't people. See that. We're good. We, we can see it now. We can say it, right. Okay, so that's what this is. So the end of this session is going to be the pink things, the paint tins come in different colors, but you can see if you if you could focus in on it, you can see diamonds and, and rhombuses and triangles and circles, or it's just me. So that's going to be the end. I just want to start off with a little bit of, um, we'll just do that because I can, right? Uh, Dublin. Um, the other day I spotted this, and I'm going to take a picture. The police are looking the other way. I want to look, and I showed this to Mark last night, and if you go back, you will remember this person. We will. I'll just push that down there. Sorry, but I need that one. Right. Thank you. So basically, so you remember that lady. There she is. I'm going to stand just over her right shoulder. And I did this all from Perth. Now the question is, you tell me where the camera is. Now, when you work with people, you've got to have a point of reference. So basically, uh, is it the red building? Is it the, I'll give you a hint. It's over there. You could all tap into that camera and have a bit of fun. And the Times Square camera and the cameras in Trafalgar Square. In fact, every traffic camera in London. Does that not scare you, Mark? It, it scares me a little bit, but it also opens okay. up a world of possibilities. So my fear is eclipsed by the potential usage we have for it in our yep. world. Okay, so I, you said to some questions. Shoot, if I can help, I will. If I can't, I'll say so and... This is for the yeah. participants. This is not about what I do. This is about what you can do. There was a very interesting one, which I think is is typical that many people might be thinking, but only one person or two people popped in the chat. I got it sent to me privately too. And it's the, it's the one you generally get, which is pretty much phrased as science is great, but how do you factor in human behavior? So that came in around the time you were looking at Stephen O'Neill's challenge and trying to maximize yep. how many people fit from a socially distanced perspective. So, I mean, this is something that comes up regularly. So how do we deal with that? Obviously, humans do what humans do. Some of them will do what we want, some of them won't. So how does the beautiful plan that increased the capacity for Stephen actually then translate into the real world? Well, that particular one is fairly straightforward because of the 
nature of the event, um, most of the people turning up are going to be escorted. So they will follow instructions. They don't want to get hurt. Um, when you could get the situation like we had um, that I saw the other day at the football when I, I went, um, basically the game wasn't from people who normally go to that stadium. They didn't know their way home. They didn't know the train stations, the buses and whatever. And they cut corners and they did all sorts of things. Um, look, humans are going, I mean, look, you can't stop stupid. You can't um, train that out of people. But we are observers of people and we're pretty good um, if we watch crowds and CCTV footage and we can predict behavior. And some of it comes down to a simpler signage and explaining. I'm getting sick of seeing, please stay over here one and a half meters apart. Can you put something more interesting there? I know what one and a half meters is. A 1.75, it's from fingertip, it's from here to here, right? I know what it is. Um, put other interesting things, help people and put the proper signage up, uh, which is wayfinding at major events um, to, to, to help people. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is, um, and I, I've learned this even to be honest with the events we've been involved in since lockdown and where you know, you're, you're trying to make that social distancing happen is a lot of people don't know what one and a half meters is or two meters is. And you're right. That's why messaging needs to be much more useful and clear than simply stating, please be 1.5 meters or two meters apart. I mean, the um, that was freaky. You kind of nearly look just like a floating I head now. <laughs> look, I could do that. I could do that. Um, but that's it. I have learned that you're right. The, the messaging needs to be more useful, basically, because lots of people do not know what two meters is uh, or 1.5. And to be honest, we don't need people having to think about their distancing that much. We want to make it so simple for them. So, I mean, we've all seen the pictures where they've drawn the circles and you stand in the middle and like you have to make it so easy for people and that's before we get into compliance and whether people consciously will choose to follow the, any new systems. We still need to try by starting with the greatest ease as possible. And as you said, you can't design out stupid. There will be people who mess with the system. But I think yeah. you're right. For that particular challenge, Stephen gave you, uh, Adrian, I think it was Adrian asked that question. Um, the the demographic um for that event and the way they're brought in very much would facilitate that that you know you'll be able to park them forgive the term uh exactly where you want them so if you have the ground marked you will be able to get those particular people for that event very easily to socially distance themselves obviously it's it's more challenging for for yeah. other events but um the purpose of today is not not so much to talk about um the COVID, but because I've worked with queues for so long, it's you know an integral, it's an integral part of what I do. There's a good question for you before you jump into that, um, yeah. from Roderick. Hi, Alan. In terms of capacities, I normally simply calculate the area and divide by the required square meter per person. What is your opinion on that? Okay. All right. Over here, it's legislated that it works out at one square meter per person. Um, Exhibitions are a little bit different, but that's the, the concept um, set up. Uh, if it's a greenfield site, I would take 80% of that. So I would take the, the figure and then take off 20%, uh, work with 80% and um, uh, you know, try and keep people as safe as possible. And 20% is a good, a good margin for error and a great starting point. Um, uh, you know, that, that may get squeezed depending on you know how much greenfield you have or whatever but i i think you're right i would definitely start with yeah. a a 20 percent cushion um another interesting thing from agent has anyone considered floor graphics tied into branding for social distancing i think so. i've seen some pictures of that type of thing all right um i've actually got a video of an emergency evacuation in a basketball outdoor um venue basketball stadium whatever you want to call it um and they put uh, the the uh, the graphics on the center court really yep yeah. i've got the i've got the a video of the test one uh yeah. and, and, and then um, they did a real one it actually happened it happened for real and um yeah it was fascinating so the lights were working different colors and they put graphics um but and this is this... with the lights or they were physical yeah. graphics stuck to the, the ground you know the ones where they they put the laser they can ah, put yes, map, maps on the thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm not quite sure what the te text called these days. So, um, yeah, that's uh, um, 
a, a, a good one. Um, and that that's the thing, you know, people are putting crosses and whatever on the floor, but they, yeah, people are human and we have to get out there. The challenge, um, Adrian, just in general, the, the challenge with flow graphics is it can probably do a job from the perspective of um, where to stand. So the socially distanced thing, what you will run into, I would expect, is that as the area fills up, uh, navigating through it, and trying to watch the ground to see where you're supposed yeah. to be, you could run into. I guess that's probably why traditionally we've always tended to work more with high level signage. Again, that isn't yeah. blocked by the crowd when the place is 50%, 50% yeah. full. Um, if anyone has more questions, just keep them coming in. Um, I'm conscious someone did. Um, it wasn't so much a question, but sent me a private message earlier on around your backup assembly points. And yes. literally sent me a message going, Mark, have you ever seen a plan that went as far as backup assembly points? Um, yep. I can't even remember if I got a chance to respond. My answer is, I have in that we've done them a couple of times. We don't do them every time. Alan will surely tell me I should do them every time. No. We <laughs> have used backups on particular events we work where in general, the whole emergency side of the planning is quite... Um, involved and I wasn't comfortable without having those backups I can't say it's something I do on every single more straightforward event I would plan Alan mm. should I be doing it on every single event ever nope there you go nope. what makes you decide to do it okay we had that particular one because it was bushfire season and there was a bushfire when that event actually ran it was over at the hospital the Fiona Stanley hospital which is um, next next door um we had to have it in place just in case we had to move everybody to one side of the venue because their cars are on the other side. So we might have had to take them further. Yeah. Um, so would th I be right major... in boiling it down to basically a risk assessment dictated Get for you whether, yeah, whether you needed them or not? Do the risk assessment. And, and, and there's a hard top venue over here. I won't say which one. And their backup plan is sort of hand scribbled, whatever. And then when you actually walk the route, you realize that the um, area is basically fenced you you can't just walk in there yeah and it may have yeah. made sense at a time and perhaps fencing appeared yep. recently but again this is another reason we always say that these plans don't get written put on a shelf and never revisited that it can look amazing but six months later a tiny bit of construction could mess it all up and you may need to uh you may need to review and that's it. and that's the thing mark with the the visuals uh music at murdoch for instance not the yeah the second or the third no the third and the fourth one i did there was a major construction the year before and all we did was take the plans and then draw in the construction and then redirect the route around yeah. and rather than starting from scratch yeah no it makes sense you, you can take a lot of what you've already used but recognize there's an issue that now needs to be factored in and then and you build from there i think m most of the comments i'm getting privately and publicly here are people saying how much they've enjoyed the session oh, so good. Quest questions wise we've covered off the ones i can see in the chat so if you want oh. to move on with your end of this all right I'll keep, I'll keep watching and if there's anything burning uh, at the end i uh, can jump in for you let's let's just if they can send them privately okay. um i will tell you as a presenter Sometimes some things go quicker than others. I nearly cut two sections out and I went, the, no, promised a few things. Um, so the, the static dynamic stuff with Brisbane and, 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 and Edinburgh. Um, and I'm glad everybody hung around. So two hours was the thing. We'll be, we'll be over in a few we'll, minutes. We'll be just over. Joe, I, I spoke to just you soon. Over. Otherwise, Joe types really quickly. He's just jumped in. I think this is Joe from um, Aventus, if I'm, if I'm correct. Alan, oh, Jojo. Ever, yeah. Have you ever come across or used any technology for effective or accurate crowd counting and monitoring, e.g. analyzing CCTV or automatic counts? You did mention some AI in your presentation. So, again. Okay. The harsh people are using it. I cannot remember the software off the, the hardware off the top of my head, but they used it at uh, MDF Beast Festival in um, Saudi Arabia. And so, it, they were count, it, because it, it was named. Because we've not named who it is, we're safe for asking this question. How did you find it? Was it accurate? Was it? Is it? A two, it's probably expensive. Um, but I, never, I, I never, I never, I never saw the whole that ho whole um, usage. Um, yeah, I was over there as a radio supervisor, and I actually helped put some of it in to help yeah. that company put it in. Um, but I could talk happily offline as as, as well about that. Um, I do know the stuff that they're putting in the Hajj is 
deadly, deadly accurate, but I don't have a brand name for that. That's all right. We're probably safer. Uh, last question. People are jumping in now because they know I'm wrapping up to let you carry on with the last bit of this. How often have you been asked to use your skills to transfer into a large scale trade show? So that type of event, not Greenfield. Have you done any of that? No, I, I've, no? I've, I've worked trade shows as a, on, on the front line looking after people going in and out, but I haven't done the actual um, planning of it. But I've attended lots okay, of them. Folks, I think... Uh, you're welcome, Joe. I think what we'll do is we'll let Alan get on at the very last section. Genuinely, he means it, like I said with Pete the last day. If you do have a question or if you do want to contact him offline, um, you'll get him easily on Twitter. You'll get him on LinkedIn. And he's a bit like, again, myself and Pete in that the worst case scenario is he's working or he's busy and it takes a little bit of time for him to come back to you. But I know Alan and he will come back to you. So if you have anything you want to ask, do get in touch we're going to carry on now with the last bit and you will get to see i haven't even seen it he would not show it to me um <laughs> the new chevron queuing system he has developed during COVID times so world okay. exclusive as they say alan i'm it gonna turn my stuff is... off yep thank off you, you go, my friend all right thank you i'm just uh, going to do a lead in with the real world um things um this is just an observation as a scientist uh, I like to stick with the facts. Uh, the COVID things around, I am working on the front line with COVID. Uh, I was up close and personal with the uh, 17 last week, got active cases. So um, I take this stuff really seriously. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is, is just show you something uh, because back in April, it was all new. I've done nine or 10 COVID courses. In fact, courtesy of William Scampton, I did it. I've done the return to sport course, um, the COVID um, courses, two of them in Ireland. I've got the certificates, I've got the t-shirt. I've also done the um, John Hopkins University uh, contact tracing course as well. So I understand the ramifications behind the scenes if someone was to get the bugs. So we have to think that they're not going to. So we had a look at the Dublin one. I'm not going to go into that one anymore. Well, shoot. Hang on a sec. Not a problem. I can press a button because that's what I do. Here it comes. Where's it gone? There it is. Okay, it's not a problem. Oh, where is it? All right. Just let me let me get in there. Right, Mark, can you just come on a sec? Because I've. Is technology messing with you? It is, and I don't know why. In fairness, there's so much technology involved in this presentation. If it's taken up until now, mess with you a bit. I think we can, we can struggle through. Matt Dinnery, you're welcome. Um, Matt is thanking us in the chat. There, we caught up with the, the certs yesterday, um, and getting them okay. issued. So I'm uh, back. I'm back. You're I'm welcome. Back, I'm back. Um, it took me too long to get to them, but it's been a busy time. So you're back. So I'm gone. Bye bye. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. The real world. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I've, I've had to load up nine files to do this, and uh, it does eat a lot of memory. Okay. So in Tel Aviv, there was a protest in April. That was my lead in, and. This is what happens in live. I ad lib as well. Here's from the Sydney Morning Herald, the overhead shot of this protest. <clears throat> now, depending how you look at this, depends what you see. And some people have looked at this and taken a model away from it. And looking at the white lines on the ground, I just want to show you what's on the ground, courtesy of a journalist who was there who works in Tel Aviv. They were positioned according to the blue dots. The blue dots, there are diamonds there. They're not perfect, but hey, give them credit. They're not crowd managers and they did something. They were positioned according to dots, not white lines, which are actually built into the ground as a sculpture. That's where if you're not sure of something, go and find out because the information is out there in the real world. Now, this is the stuff. Mark's seen two of these, but he hasn't seen the third. And I did take on board some of his um, comments last night because uh, he was reacting exactly as I thought he would. So this was my early version of working 
with the material. Let me share it, step you through it, especially if you didn't quite pick it up before. So Emerald version, 10 by 10 grid, 10 units. I don't care what the distance is. I'm not going to waste your real estate. So basically, I'm using half of it. A square tessellates, a circle doesn't. A triangle tessellates. OK. So let's fill it up with people now. I hope Bert's still here. Bert sent me a message just before we came on. And Bert uh, wrote a paper for people uh, returning um, back into the workplace and things uh, in Belgium. And he pointed out and did some amazing maths on why this is actually not making the best use of your um, area. So there's an equilateral triangle. The base is the same length as the unit. So there it is. They are one unit apart. They are one unit apart, but diagonally they are not. And Bert's paper highlights that. So what do you do? Back what we did before. Move them half a unit left. Move them all up. Move them up a quarter. Move them across a quarter. Find an empty space. Fill it up. And off we go. Now, the shape is a diamond, not a triangle, because the marking out is a lot easier. The diamond has to be facing the direction. After that discussion of the toilets on LinkedIn, this is actually what I played with, because you go forwards, then into the entry and go to the toilets. Let's just do use the real estate and put the whole the whole area in. And you know those people who stand there and you say, hey, here, go mark it out for me. Give them a can of spray paint and off they go. You can actually do this by numbers if you actually put the numbers around. It's a lot of fun. Join the dots by numbers and look, the diamonds appear before you. You don't need a template. You don't need whatever. You just need straight lines, equidistant apart, and it works itself out. That's the simple version. The beauty for me is, and this was uh, many iterations, and Ben Crabb was very supportive on this. Okay, 100 on the left, 120 on the right. If I was to move them a bit, I probably could squeak 126 in there. But you know what? I think that's pretty good. How do you mark it out? Well, let's take you back to the gift that uh, Stephen O'Neill gave me and gave the industry. So we left it at that. We've got 138, we had 131, we started, so we've increased by 27, 25%. Give you a little hint, all right? If you cut the edges of the diamonds and flip them down or move them to the other side, it will fit the area exactly. That's why this will always be 25%. But don't tell anyone, all right? My little secret. So how do you mark it out? Pick the longest line, and in this case, Two lines at 60 degrees. I don't care whether you use laser beams. I don't care whether you use string or tape measures, right? Send Rupert Bassadoni out there with his golf truck trolley because he needs to get away from the kids and he loves doing this sort of stuff. You could mark it out. You don't have to put marks on the floor. You can make little commemorative things or whatever, and then they can take it away as a souvenir. Now. Diamonds is what it's all about. I'm going to step you through this. There's a lot of work gone into this. <clears throat> you are familiar with this picture, so I'm going to keep this picture, the orientation this way, because you're familiar with it. And that's where we left hexagonal circle packing. I'm going to take you back a couple of weeks. I was standing on a train station at 25 past five in the morning. Jeez, it was cold. Looking at my feet, taking a picture because what else do you do in the morning? And I'm looking at the ACROD, as we call it, dots there deliberately taken. Like I'm going, now, if the people with disabilities go down there and the VIPs go down there and the express people go there and we have a queuing system there, two days later, when I was getting ready, I took this picture. And some of you, have, of you will have seen this on LinkedIn, standing on the train, probably looking at my feet. I could have made that picture perfect, but I did it on the train. Then I uploaded it before I got to work, and then I played around on the computer. The pattern 
is there. Your physical distance queuing pattern is right there in front of you. It is diamonds. There are your squiggly lines, and that is where I stopped Mark last night. Here's how you do it. I'm leaving the lines of the diamonds in so that you can see you go left, then right, then left, then right. Left, then right, left, then right. If you cut the edges and the tops of the diamonds and flip them around, you can fiddle in the whole space. It does it. Now, when I got to work, I had to write it down on paper. This piece of paper. It may not look neat. I, it's not neat by my standards. But that's my signature on there, the 24th of the 6th, 2020. And that's how this model evolved. Here's how it works. The punters, zig, then zag. Hey, zig, then zag. We go, hey, they're zigging and zagging. Hey, they're zigging and zagging. This is the Fiona Stanley Hospital next to Murdoch University. It's four Ks down the road. It's built in an area with the Banksia trees and the facade is designed on the Banksia nut. Diamonds. Turn the zigzag around on its side and I tweeted, or not tweeted, I put out on LinkedIn. If you look to the right of this and look at the building on the right, you can sort of see a new fencing system as well. Two diamonds put together makes a chevron. It's the bottom two thirds of a hexagon. I'm going to flip it on its side. I'm going to match Fiona Stanley Hospital, the world premiere of my Chevron queuing system. Four Chevrons per queue in name, all physically distanced, 25% more in this area using this method. Now, yes, someone might say that, oh, but someone could walk straight through. Well, that's your job to figure that out. And if someone's going to walk straight through, you don't have a queuing system, you've got a walking route and it's not been managed. If you do this, there is no physical possibility if they follow those lines of coming any closer to anybody. Allometry, remember, is to do with the nose. We're not interested in body size. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Chevron queuing system as I see it. I'm Alan Wilson. I love crowds and I'm done. It's been a delight. Thank you. He definitely is Alan Winston, and he definitely does love crowds. Um, I think I'm going to be seeing uh, diamonds and chevrons in my sleep for a while. They're everywhere, mate. <laughs> they are everywhere. This happened to me if, uh, many years ago, and it was parallelograms, and it was Roger Barrett's fault, and it was to do with structural uh, integrity, and I ended up just seeing parallelograms everywhere. So now we've moved on to uh, diamonds and, and chevrons. Um, Look, we, we still have a few hundred people in the room. Um, thank you all for sticking with us for a couple of hours. Um, Alan, I, I want to thank you. Um, and I know I've thanked you already, but I need to do this publicly because um, I've had a lot of messages uh, on my phone, on here, privately, in the chat. Uh, by the way, when I shut this down, if you keep the window open, you'll be able to scan back through that chat if you want before you shut it for yourself. Oh, okay. you, you might see, um, you'll see a lot of nice comments there. I got a lot privately too. Um, I, I think the way you presented this was always going to appeal to more people than it wouldn't appeal to. And I always felt that those people would be the vocal ones who would be very quick to tell us how, how they felt about this presentation and, and how amazing it was for them. And I think you've proven the point, uh, not that it needed proving, that a lot of us are very, very visual. And that's why an awful lot of people are sending me messages going, this has been brilliant because it's been so visual. So you're not the only one. I think who's who's that visual and enjoys learning and taking information and presenting it that way um an awful lot of people found this really really good and and it was fast and there was a lot in it but you knew that and that was the plan and we we're trying to give as much value as we could to people yep. uh, and i think the fact that you genuinely mean it when you invite people to get in touch with you afterwards and you know challenge you on this or ask you about that or whatever um that provides that extra value for people so they can take time when the recording's up I'll have it up in the next day or two. They might spot something they want to pick your brain on. You yep. could actually be inundated with stuff, but that's your own fault for doing yeah. such an interesting presentation. Um, no, so it's a good it, problem to have. Yeah. Look, my absolute um, pleasure. Um, 
yeah, we rehearsed things, we planned things, we had backup plans in case um, I went off sick with the with the bug, as I call it. Uh, it's just scratching on the surface. What we want to do is tapping because there's one thing that's not happening out there. There is a website for the event book of knowledge. A lot of people don't even know it's been going for 20 years, but what's happening to the crowd management book of knowledge? Okay, everybody talks about historical events and we were yeah. doing it last night. You know, I showed you that I didn't know about it. Ian Mixton told me, the historian dude, right? Ski jumps at Wembley Stadium. Well, Mark amazing. goes, what do you mean? And I'm showing him the video. Then Ben Crabb goes, hey, whoa, what about the scaffolding? I go find the video yeah. for that and going, I was one year old I when never, this happened. I never asked you, are those videos on YouTube or do you have those files? The British... Um, are they around Pathologi somewhere? Yes, they're in the well, YouTube. Sorry, my, real, my real question is, can we make them available to people on a LinkedIn post yep. or something? Can you do that? Because I people, do that. they're impossible to describe. We're wasting our time. But watch Alan's LinkedIn. He's going to put up a link to these videos and just take note of the year, take note of what's happening, take note of the scaffolding structures and just be amazed. There's yeah. some comments there. Thank people saying stuff like, I'm glad others are as nerdy about all this stuff as we are. If you're actually nerdy about this stuff, watch those videos when Alan pops them up on LinkedIn. They're just... They're black and white. They're old, but they're fascinating what they were doing back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, and I appreciate, um, I, I may not um, be able to to read all the comments because it did crash out in the middle because of... Um, oh, yeah, you'll have lost some. Whatever yeah. it did. So I've lost some, but that's, that's well, not actually, a problem. Well, actually, I have found a, I have found a way of um, exporting the chat in a much more readable format. So as yeah. my gift okay. to you, I will export that chat and make it readable and uh, you'll be able to read through what, what yep. people were saying. Um, because what I, we'd think, like to be honest, to I think you deserve it with the with the time and the effort that's gone into this. Andrew Roberts says Chevrons are the new black. <laughs> they might be. Oh, we will all be talking about Chevrons for a while. Um, that that they're, they're everywhere. I, I like that Chevrons the the, 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 the new, new black. black. That could be your thing. Um, it is at another level, and there's only three people in the world know where I'm taking it. My diamond version, which is more for people who are really driving into it. We spoke about it last night. I'm hoping to do a PhD on that side of crowd management. Um, but um, there is a mathematical philosophy behind it, which I stumbled across. And if you want to pack in the most people in an area with the least amount of, of um, area around an area, stick with the diamonds and you'll get it. Right? Yeah. But if you want to really, really, really do it, there is another shape you can use. Right. Well, I and suggest you do that PhD. And on behalf of us nerds in the industry who aren't as mathematical as you are, but will gladly adopt some tools that make our lives easier, we look forward to uh, to you completing that PhD and giving us that gift. Yep. Look, my, my pleasure. And as I say, um, the big thing with um, a lot of things is that... Uh, <sighs> There's the operational side of things. And you've said it before that your mum says no one uses Excel. I showed you the dot plan. I click on a button and it tells me who is making that yeah. call sign, going where, whatever. But it's all in my head because I haven't got time to look at things. Right? Those files at the beginning, that's what the story Blue was. Blue folder yes, it... started it all. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say goodbye. I, I've thanked you. So I'm going to thank everyone else in the room. I'm going to remind everyone we're back on Friday with one... Uh, a webinar on medical i think we only have a couple left um which is which is fascinating to me that they've gone so quickly um mark fuster has said it very well in the chat he says he has sat through some great web webinars during covid and this one has definitely been up there thank you alan so i'm going to leave it on that um thank you alan indeed i hope people enjoyed this one and uh, we shall talk to you guys soon